When Jesus returns, will the second coming be a repeat of the Exodus? Will it be a second Exodus? And if so, will it be related to Passover, since the first Exodus occurred in relation to a Passover as well? Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, saying they wouldn't see him again until they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Since this is part of the Egyptian Hallel Psalms set on Passover, does this mean that the Jews won't see Jesus until after a Passover? We're going to answer that. Does the second coming have something to do with Passover? Yes, and we'll unpack all that in this episode as well. In fact, the Bible is abundantly clear that the second coming is a lot like Exodus. As in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, which of course was on a Passover, I will show you miracles, Micah 7.15. So the miracles of the second coming are similar to the ones in the days of the Exodus. This is something the first century Jews understood from their knowledge of the Old Testament, but today's Christians have missed by focusing on just the New Testament and missing the links between what we see in Revelation and what the Old Testament says. And the prophecy about this link between the Exodus and the Second Coming is from one of the most unique prophets in the Bible, Balaam. Yes, the same one with the talking donkey. He was a Moabite who was called on by Balak, the king of the Moabites, to curse the Israelites <laughs> for a fee. However, all Balaam could do was bless Israel. That made Balak angry. He wasn't getting his money's worth. And before we begin this section, let me say I've learned about this interpretation from an outstanding new book by Travis Snow called The Passover King. Looking for a good book? Pick this one up. Now, Back to Balaam. He tried to curse Israel four separate times, but each time the blessings for Israel got better and better, and the consequences for Moab got worse and worse. The first time Balaam stated, How can I curse whom God has not cursed, and how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? So Balak made Balaam inquire of the Lord again, but this time, Balaam discussed the exodus which had just occurred. God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. Behold, a people rises like a lioness. And as a lion, it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. So in this passage, Balaam equates Israel with a lion. So Balaam inquired of the Lord yet a third time. And here's where it gets very, very interesting. He personalizes what he just said about Israel and makes it about a great king of Israel who will eventually come out of Egypt. Everything he said about them, the Israelites, is now about him, this great king. And his king shall be higher than Agag. And his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, for he is like the horns of the wild ox. He will devour the nations who are his adversaries and will crush their bones in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. He crouches. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him? Blessed is everyone who blesses you and cursed is everyone who curses you. Numbers 23, 8, 9. Notice, this king comes up out of Egypt. There is one of the second Exodus connections. Keep that in mind. What Israelite king ever came out of Egypt? After three blessings of Israel, King Balak was about as angry as Balaam had been against his poor defenseless donkey. So he made Balaam give a fourth vision. And in this vision, Balaam identified this king who comes out, out of Egypt in a very familiar passage. 
I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down the sons of Shep. Edom shall be a possession. Seir, its enemies, also will be a possession while Israel performs valiantly. I think everyone realizes this king is Jesus, someone who will come out of Egypt in the future. And the crushing of the head of Moab is a reference to Genesis 3.15, where Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. This was the first messianic prophecy in the Bible, by the way. Before we leave this prophecy, however, I want to focus on something I learned from Travis Snow in his book. The name Agag in this prophecy, which we kind of glossed over, might not be Agag. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. In the Septuagint and numerous other versions of the Old Testament, this name of this king is Gog. Yes, Gog, like in Ezekiel 38, not Agag. Could it be Gog? Could the Masoretic texts of Numbers be mistranslated? If it is Gog, it explains many things. In Ezekiel 38, 17, we read, Thus says the Lord God, Are you the one I spoke of in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel? This has always been a mystery to Bible expositors. Who spoke of Gog previously? Maybe it was Balaam. And if so, then Gog is the Antichrist, as we discussed in our series on Gog and Magog. A link to that playlist is down in the description if you want to view it. So in summary, this group of visions and numbers says that Jesus will be a conquering king and come up out of Egypt in a repeat of the Exodus in the end times. Now, do other books of the Bible confirm this? Well, we just saw earlier that Micah does. And in Isaiah, we read, Behold, the Lord is riding a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So at some point, Jesus comes on the clouds to Egypt. That places him there for a second exodus. This second passage from Isaiah 19 places the Antichrist in command of Egypt at that time also. Moreover, I will deliver the Egyptians into the hands of a cruel master, and a mighty king will rule over them, declares the Lord of hosts. Antichrist will be like a modern pharaoh. This is parallel to Daniel 11, where the Antichrist is seen to take control of Egypt. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. So the table is set. And if the second coming is a lot like the Exodus, let's start to look at what happened during the first Exodus and see if we can apply clues from the first Exodus account. Initially, the Israelites were slaves. And so they will be again. Now this is a very tough pill to swallow for a lot of Christians. Never again is the watchword of Israel. Never again will there be another Holocaust or never again will Israel go into exile. Unfortunately, as much as we'd like that to be true, it just doesn't square up with the biblical account. In Zechariah, we read about the end times. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Rape, pillage, murder, exile. Not a pretty picture. The one Jesus paints is no better. There will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles 
until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Death and captivity. A captivity that is specifically said to be into all the nations. So as much as we don't want to hear this, there will be another Holocaust and another exile. The Jews will be slaves again. The prophet Joel says they have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine. The Bible is clear, but it's also clear there will be another exodus and freedom for the captives. The first exodus began with a series of plagues designed to break up the fallow ground of the heart of Pharaoh. We know these plagues by heart. Every Passover Seder meal, they are recounted. Blood, frogs, gnats, flies, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the death of the firstborn. In the end times, the trumpets, and to some extent the bowl judgments, mimic these original plagues. The first trumpet contains hail and fire. The second trumpet involves turning the sea to blood. The third trumpet involves poisoning the fresh water, which could cause frogs, lice, and gnats. The fourth trumpet involves darkness. The fifth trumpet involves locusts, although they are demonic locusts. And the sixth trumpet involves death, the death of one third of the world's population. So as you can see, there is a one for one comparison between the plagues and the trumpets, and it's uncanny. In fact, in the Revelation 9.20, the Bible even refers to the trumpet judgments as plagues. But just as Pharaoh's heart was hardened in the first exodus, this is what we read will happen in the second exodus. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands. But after the plagues, we continue to read this in Isaiah 19. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. And it will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. And does this second exodus happen during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, just as the first one did? That is our theory and the theory of Travis Snow. So God will rescue the repentant Egyptians and free the Israelites in this second exodus. Now this might appear a very different kind of second coming than what you have been envisioning. Most think Jesus lands at the Mount of Olives and in the same day fights the battle of Armageddon. That it is a one day battle. But it, that is not what the Bible teaches. The first plagues and exodus were not a one-day ordeal either, and in my opinion, neither will the second one be. Rather, the Bible teaches a second coming is a longer event than a single day, much longer. We're sure you want to prove this to yourself, and you should. It's important that you do. If you still think the second coming is a single day, you will miss the beauty and intricacy of what God has planned. So in the next video, we'll give you the chance to do just that, to prove to yourself the second coming is more than a day. In fact, more than a month, more than six months. And we'll show you how and how all the events of the second coming are organized based on the feasts of the Lord or what are sometimes called the Moedim. If you want to keep watching well, click right here. And if you want to catch up on previous episodes in this series on Passover and the Third Temple, well, click right here. And don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification. 
So when that new episode on the timetable of the second coming is released, you can be informed. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.